The legal definition of driving while intoxicated is when a person operates a motor vehicle on a public highway while intoxicated. And intoxication is, is legally defined as when a person no longer has the normal use of their mental or physical faculties due to the introduction of alcohol and or drugs into their body. Your typical violent crime, which is why I think at least that people don't look at it as being something as serious. Most of the DWI cases that we end up making, there's not a wreck, um, nobody's hurt, and people kind of look at it like, you know, yeah, maybe I had a little bit too much, but, you know, nobody's hurt, you know, I should, really shouldn't go to jail for it, uh, it's no big okay. deal. Have you had anything to drink tonight? No. Nothing at all? Nothing at all. Give me a favor, step out of the car real quick. This is our driver. Uh, basically, they were coming from a bar, headed home. Uh, he was traveling at a high rate of speed. He lost control, went off from the freeway, off onto the feeder road. And he was able to get out of the truck and got transported. But the female was actually trapped in the truck, so they had to actually get her out of the truck. Once I got here, I was able to get his information. And uh, now all we're waiting for is for the nurse to come draw his blood. This is the DWI tonight. I think if people saw a lot of the things that we see on the streets at night and hear the stories and talk to the victims and talk to the families, that's what I think would really paint the picture for people about how tragic DWI can end up being. The people I see in court are, are everyday people like you and me. Anybody who drinks and drives is at risk of being arrested and convicted of driving while intoxicated. So just last night, uh, one of the task force members had a 17-year-old um, that I believe was uh, double the limit at, at .16 when he uh, got his breath back, so seven, 17 years old. DWI happens to good people every day, no matter how old you are. Um, I've had friends that have been arrested for DWI, uh, people that I've been close to arrested for DWI. Um, it doesn't make you a bad person. There's executives that get brought in, just like there's people that are almost homeless. Um, so it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what kind of education you have. It doesn't matter what kind of job you have, or if you even have a job. Um, DWI affects everybody. It's real, real quick to us when we get up to the car whether somebody in the car has been drinking or not. So the quick, uh, oh, I haven't had anything to drink, you know, that we can smell it as soon as the windows open, start talking to it for just a minute. That's a threat too. I had like one drink. No, oh my god, don't get that sh out. You're a sh person and I know your grandma loves you for. Huh? I want to be let go. I want my f***ing dignity because I didn't do anything wrong. I'm a school teacher, mother I'm not intoxicated. I'm not drunk. What kind of car do you have? Huh? What kind of car do you have? BMW. BMW? Is that what you were driving tonight? I am a 
bit under the influence. I admit that. I do admit that. You see what I'm saying? That's your game. Y'all know how to Let me talk to my f***ing mother. I got my rights, right? You like me. I got my rights. Let go of me. Let go of me. You're hurting me. You remember what street you were driving on? You see this? You see this, bitch? You see this? There's throw up on the ground. Go away! The common popular misconception is that's stuff that only happens to somebody else. It won't happen to me. You're lucky if all you do is get arrested. And I, by lucky, I mean because we've had a lot of people that, you know, you, they drink, they drive, they don't think about it, they drink, they drive, and they end up getting in an accident. They either kill themselves, they'll, they'll kill a friend of theirs, like if they've got passengers, or they end up killing or hurting somebody else. Lots and lots of DWI cases, unfortunately. Um, we get them all the time. Usually, um, probably the majority of the time, they hurt themselves. Um, but there's a pretty large percentage where they hurt somebody else at the same time. It's not uncommon to have significant intra-abdominal injuries where the guts are literally, literally pulled loose over a long area. Lose, you just lose that part. Busted livers, busted spleen, caved in chest, inability to breathe, pneumonia, and Plenty of head injuries, too, because that head gets to bouncing around in there. And, of course, that's the worst thing, that, that and spinal injuries, where people end up with spinal cord injuries. We have homicide come in, um, and they review a lot of these cases. Um, a lot of these are like manslaughter-type cases um, because of the drinking and driving, or, and not even drinking. Sometimes it can be prescription drugs. A lot of people tend to think that the prescription drugs are safer because they're coming from a pharmacy. And that's really not the case. They can be just as dangerous and just as intoxicating as the alcohol. I've had too many cases where I've stopped uh, somebody 16, 17 years old going 50, 60 miles an hour in, the, in a, the middle of the city, not thinking about not just themselves, but the other people that are, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of foot traffic in the city. Um, and, you know, they, them, they themselves are not worried about Thinking, or thinking about if they get in a crash at 60 miles an hour in the middle of the city, what's going to happen to them, their car, their passengers in the car? I don't think that that ever even comes through, the, through their head. And it took me going to, to jail to see how lucky I am. Every DWI arrest that we make has the potential to be one of those multiple fatality crashes which is why it makes it that much more important for us to stop people before they get into a wreck. I have a motorcycle rider here. He's not in very good shape. No, he's not a fatality yet, but somebody needs to come here and make it. They got several cars involved. 88, I can swing by. I have a motorcycle rider here. He's not in very good shape. No, he's not a town yet, but somebody needs to come here and make it. They got several cars involved. Already accident unit out here. They're primary on it. However, they're asking for North, shape, uh, North Shepherd assistance uh, to stop all eastbound traffic and uh, make a exit off the freeway. And then we need to back everybody off. They're going to have a survey and everything. We're going to be here uh, for a while. Uh, with an accident, like that, uh, where there, you have someone who's been seriously injured. Uh, as a patrol officer, you would go out to the location and basically secure the scene, uh, not let uh, not let anybody through, not let anybody out who's there, uh, you know, witnesses and, and whatnot, and uh, block block roadways. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're first responders, so you go there and you basically see the the field, and, and then you decide what it is and what you're going to do. When vehicles were set up, there were three of them blocking all four lanes and we had the flares out. We were continuously, but you know, relighting them just to make sure all traffic was diverted correctly. About 30 minutes after the freeway was closed, with the investigation in full swing, 
Officer Estrada spotted the Volkswagen Beetle approaching, and it wasn't slowing down. Behind the wheel was 26-year-old Johan Rodriguez. He was intoxicated. He was speeding. And he was headed straight for the barricade. The vehicle started speeding up towards us, and then it slowed down. And I, I let the other officers know that it was coming, because I thought for sure it was just going to blow through us. It went around my vehicle at a high rate of speed, and uh, I'd left my car door open just in case something had happened. And uh, I ran to my car and put the pedal to the floor, and I tried to catch up to it. It could have been going 80 miles per hour when it passed me. Officer Medlin, who was still blocking the entrance ramp, was the next person to spot Rodriguez approaching. Uh, I knew it wasn't a patrol unit because uh, behind him I saw uh, a patrol unit coming. I saw flashing lights. And uh, just at the speed he was going, no officer would drive towards the accident that fast. You know, where you know, nobody drives like that. I grabbed the radio and, and uh, uh, screamed whatever I could scream and uh, put my car in drive, uh, you know, all, all at the same time and, and started to, to pull out into the highway just to, I threw my lights on, try to get them to wake up, stop, you know, pay something, do something. I mean, you got a cop car chasing you and one pulling out in front of you, you would, you would, you would think, you know. A security camera at an auto leasing company along the freeway captured the last moments of Rodriguez's approach. Yo, watch out, Norton, watch out. SO, watch out. The impact of Officer Will's body caused so much damage to Rodriguez's car and to his face that he was forced to come to a stop. I remember brake lights, and he started to pull over to the side because he was uh, in the middle of the freeway when he hit the officer. And he pulls over to the left, and so do I. And I get out of my vehicle. I let dispatch know where we are, and uh, there are people running across the freeway, and I'm still not sure exactly what's going on just yet. It was uh, gut wrenching. Uh, it was a uh, state of panic. You, you don't want to think that what had happened had really happened, but as you're getting closer and getting, you know, running up to the scene, it's you know you, you're building the picture. You just don't want to see it. And I walk up to the car and I see him and he's got this really grotesque cut in the middle of his face and his entire sinus canal is visible. It was pretty nasty. Officer Estrada and myself, uh, we, we approached the car. Um, we came up to the car and uh, you know it's uh, a lot the process but there, um, I was shocked that he was alive. So I notice him, I notice his hands, his music's blurring. The windshield's cracked, and uh, down in the passenger seat is a uh, some beer of some kind. I don't even remember what kind it was anymore. And I look past the passenger window, and there's a body on the ground. And at first, I didn't know if it was from the previous fatality or if it could have been a new one. I placed him in handcuffs, and uh, I searched him uh, to see what he had on him on his body. His radio was too loud to hear my sirens. He was too intoxicated to know what was going on. Medlin's search revealed a small bag of cocaine in Rodriguez's pocket. While there was no cocaine found in his system, his blood alcohol level was 0.19, well over twice the legal limit. Officer Don Egdorf was working another location when the first calls came through. I was actually on night shift at the time. Um, in May of 2011, um, was assigned to one of our bat vans out at the Gulf Freeway in Edgebrook. And as I was sitting out there waiting on other officers to bring uh, intoxicated drivers to me, I heard some traffic on the radio that, that really caught my attention. With the death of Officer Will, a second accident scene was now on top of the first. The officers who had just seen one of their own lose his life still had to finish the investigation. When I got up to the scene, um, I was actually on the westbound lanes of the loop uh, going by and to exit and U-turn and come back up. 
and it just, it looked like chaos up there. There's police cars everywhere, there's ambulance, there's fire trucks, there's a little bit of everything. The scene was certainly not what I anticipated. It was a very traumatic scene. Kevin Will was 37 years old. His wife, Alicia, was six months pregnant at the time of his death. She was at home when they delivered the news. Rodriguez's trial was held in June of 2012. Although he pleaded guilty to intoxication manslaughter of a peace officer, it was still up to prosecutors to present a case that would allow the jury to fully understand exactly what happened that night. The evidence is overwhelming. Um, and even on a plea of guilty, uh, it obviously changes the state's burden because you're, it is assumed that it's beyond a reasonable doubt. But the fact is you still have to make sure the jury understands the intricacies of what happened. We put on the whole story for them. Um, we were fortunate in this case to basically have the entire story on video. So they got to see um, what Kevin saw before he died. You, you see as Officer Will comes to rest, you see as the defendant's car comes to rest, you see as he's being taken out of the car by officers who are present at the scene. At the same time, you've got the radio um, call-outs from all the officers. So you put it all together and it's uh, very eerie um, and pretty unbelievable that you can see it as it unfolds and as it happens. Officers who were on scene that night took to the stand as witnesses. In addition to actual footage and dispatch tapes, a reconstruction video was presented. We are someone break through our scene. I will need an ambulance en route. It looks like it could be a fatality. Nice, send me uh, two more units over here. We just had a car blow through and I, I, I think we, we may have a, an accident unit down. Uh, send me two more units, please. 7389, it's, it's an officer. No pulse on our officer here at the seat. Yeah, I can swing by. Already an accident unit out here. They're primary on it. However, they're asking for North, Shape, uh, North Shepherd assistance uh, to stop all eastbound traffic and uh, make a exit off the freeway. And then we need to back everybody off. They're going to have a survey and everything. We're going to be here uh, for a while. Yeah, 